Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Jesus Christ is King. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today with special guest, Roy Showman. Roy, how you doing, brother? I'm doing fine, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Roy grew up studying Judaism under the most prominent rabbis in American Judaism. After receiving a BS from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School, he taught at Harvard. His unexpected conversion to Catholicism led him led to a dramatic refocus of his activities. He currently hosts a Catholic TV show, studies, and writes on religious topics. Today, we're going to be talking about his book, Salvation is from the Jews, published by Ignatius Press. We have much of his work linked below. Uh, Roy, can you tell us about some of your good work that you're doing for the church? <laughs> trying to stay in a state of grace and out of sin. That's the biggest thing. Um, well, I, I wrote a couple of books and um, I've been doing a lot of, I had been doing a lot of speaking for evangelization. I invited to parishes and parish missions and, and you know, gave retreats and, and uh, so forth. That kind of um, dried up in the current flu season, let's say. And uh, so now I'm doing a lot of work on the internet, over the internet. I have a daily live stream show that's both a Divine Mercy Chaplet and a Rosary, but it's also, um, you know, talking on various topics of Catholic spirituality. Uh, and sometimes the apocalyptic overtones of what's going on in the world today. And, um, and that's that's pretty much it, I guess. I... I you know, I'm doing a lot of teaching and, and preaching, so to speak, over online now because of the difficulty having lo large gatherings. Yes. Th well, thank you so much for your, all your good work. And I've really enjoyed your book. We're going to be talking about uh, a lot of the themes that you present in your book. Uh, we won't have time to go into everything you do uh, bring up. But um, the first subject I'd like to discuss with you is the subject of Jewish identity. Now, viewers, you can listen to Roy's conversion story, which we'll touch on a few here, but you need to really hear the whole story, which Roy has given to the faithful many times, but that's linked below. Uh, but I want to talk about Jewish identity. Now, you pay, say on page 353, one of the most notable attributes which with, with which God has imbued the Jews is their passionate loyalty to their own identity as Jews. To the extent that it represents loyalty to the one true God, this is pure virtue. However, this virtue has stood in the way of the recognition of who Jesus was both 2,000 years ago and today. And you mentioned later, they are rejecting him out of loyalty to him. So can you elaborate on that more for the viewers and understanding what is the meaning of Jewish identity and how can you elaborate on what you mean by rejecting him out of loyalty to him? Sure. Uh, I'll make this brief. So I'll only start with the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> is where I'll have to start the story. Uh, but I'll still keep it under about three or four or five minutes. Okay, because that's where the story begins. Uh, one of the mistakes that Catholics uh, can fall into is thinking that the Catholic religion started in some sense 2,000 years ago. And it, the relationship between God and man that is reflected in the Catholic Church started 2,000 years ago. Now, that's both true and that's not true, because in fact, the Catholic Church and Christianity is the plan for the salvation of all of mankind that God came up with already in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Um, when Adam fell, Adam and Eve fell, the original exalted relationship between God and man was shattered. And at that very moment, of course, God knew that at some point in the future, he would not only restore man to that original exalted state, but actually raise him to an infinitely higher state through the incarnation of the second person of the most holy trinity as a man at a future point in time. So the system, so to speak, 
which we now know as the Catholic Church, in some sense, had its origin already in the Garden of Eden. Now, if the second person of the Most Holy Trinity was going to incarnate as a man, then it would be as a particular man in a particular place in the world among a particular people. Um, and they, those people would have to be prepared. And that's what the Jewish people were. They were the people who were chosen, you could say, at random out of all of the people on earth to prepare for the incarnation of God as man. If they were going to prepare for the incarnation of God as man, they would have to be kept separate from everyone else wandering the face of the earth for about 2,000 years. And they would have to be the re uh, recipients of a tremendous amount of divine revelation to first of all know about the one true uncreated creator God, to know about the creation of man, the fall of man, the seriousness of sin, the need for redemption, the future coming of a redeemer. They would have to be given enough prophecy to identify the redeemer when he came. They would have to be given enough understanding of theology to make sense of what was happening and to um, <clears throat> spread the gospel throughout the world after it happened. And they would have to be raised up in moral purity to the point where they could produce, if you excuse the expression, a virgin of such nobility and purity that she could give her flesh and blood to be the flesh and blood of the God-man. And that's what the Jews were. Um, now, the intention was, of course, that they were chosen for that role, not for their own sake, because they're special, but because God had to choose somebody, by definition, in order to host the incarnation. And those people would have to be kept separate for long enough to be developed to the point where the incarnation could happen. That's what the Jews were. Now, if, if that's what the Jews' job was, and that's actually in the Old Testament, their main job is simply not even to really stay faithful to God in a very detailed way, but to stay separate and to stay responsive to the stream of divine revelation, it makes sense that God would give them uh, an ability to stay separate. And he gave them that ability to stay separate, I think, in part through the laws, which prevented their assimilation to a large extent. And perhaps also he gave them a nature that made them tend to stay separate, you know, whether that's... Um, hard-heartedness and stiff-neckedness and so forth. That's, you know, that that um, St. Stephen accuses the Jews of. But in any case, so their insistence on their separate Jewish identity, I will argue, was their primary responsibility, their primary vocation for 2,000 years. The need for it ended 2,000 years ago, but, but, but they don't know that. Okay. Uh, see, this is very fascinating. Do you think that there, due to an excessive reaction against Judaizing, there has been sort of a wall that has blocked Jewish conversion because Jews has, have been asked to completely renounce their Jewishness in order to accept Christ. You're going to have to define Judaizing for me, not because I don't know what it means, but because it has a number of different meanings. Sure. Um, the trusting in the ceremonial precepts of the mosaic law for salvation great thank you it's much easier to deal with it sure. with such precision the um the whole issue of um that you're raising it, it's 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 almost universally confused and the reason it gets confused is because you have to be very strict in keeping separate two concepts one is the election of the Jews. The, um, you know, as St. Paul says, the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. They're still beloved for the sake of their forefathers. You've got the election of the Jews on the one hand, and you have this, sacrific this sacramental sacrificial system for the remission of sins, as described in the Old Testament on the other hand. So you've got the sacramental system of Old Testament Judaism on the one hand, and you have the election of the Jews, whatever that means, on the other hand. If you stir them together in the same pot, you inevitably are going to fall into one of two errors. Either an error that is frequently called supersessionism, which is that the election of the Jews has ended because they were unfaithful to God when Christ came, and therefore God has removed any aspect of their election or their calling and transferred it to the church. 
again, supersessionism, everyone who uses it, the word has a different definition. So that's why I have to be a little bit careful. But you either fall into the error that the election of the Jews has ended, or you fall into the error that Jews don't need Jesus because they still are in their original saving covenant with God, which is referred to as the dual covenant theory. The, the whole confusion goes away if you keep separate the sacramental system in the Old Testament with the election. Clearly, the sacramental system in the Old Testament went away. And even if it didn't go away in God's books, it went away because when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Jews weren't able to follow it anymore. So, of course, there is no salvific value to ritual Judaism, let's say. They can't be because it required the temple, which hasn't existed. Never mind the fact that there shouldn't be because, because it was only a prefigurement of Christ anyway. However, you can't conclude from that that the election has gone away. And St. Paul, as well as the last five popes, have made it very clear the election hasn't gone away. Uh, as St. Paul said, um, um, they are still beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable, and so forth. Did that answer your question? Yeah, so that raises uh, one of the most pertinent questions that you get at, and that is an elaboration on the meaning of election. So what I hear you saying is you're making a distinction between election and salvific efficacy. You're not saying that election is salvific, in the sense that the Jew does not need to be baptized, you're saying that the election is the calling, the gifts and calling of God. Can you elaborate on what that means still today? Um, uh, no. <laughs> how, do, how do you like that? No, I can't. I can elaborate a little bit, but I can't give you a straight answer because I have the foggiest idea. Um, all I know is what God says. I, and I'm all very reluctant to put words in his mouth because one day I'm going to be called to account for that. So um, I'm happy. I have a bookmark here. I mean, I, I'm happy to read scripture because we know that's true and you don't get in trouble. Um, this is St. Paul, letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 11. I asked then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Okay. What's that mean? What's rejection mean? What's acceptance mean? I'm standing back from that. Okay. Um, and then later in the chapter, he says, um, as regards the gospel, there are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. So there, that's, I, I don't want to go further than that because that's as far as scripture goes. But I don't see, you can't erase it. You mm -hmm. may not be able to understand it, but you can't take an eraser and erase it. Right. I think that's, I think that's wise. Um, the, but, I, but it is clear what you're not saying. What you're not saying is that Jews do not need to be baptized because of this election. Well, Roy isn't saying that. Jesus said that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, let, let me ask you further about Jewish identity. Now, you have this, um, you're, once again, viewers need to go listen or watch Roy give his full testimony, but this is going to be quoting from what you give at the end of the book, which is where you initially, uh, you're raised Jewish, you're studying on the Hasidic rabbi, then you kind of fall away from your faith for some time, but you have a, this mystical experience where you say you, you fell into heaven. I found myself most consciously and tangibly in the presence of God. And this is where you beg to know God's name. You say this, let me know your name. I don't mind if you are a Buddha and I have to become a Buddhist. I don't mind if you are Apollo, I have to become a Roman pagan. I don't mind if you're Krishna, I have to become a Hindu. As long as you are not Christ and I have to become a Christian. This deep-seated resistance to Christianity was based on the sense I had of Christianity as the enemy, the perversion of Judaism that had been the cause of two millennia of Jewish suffering. So I'm wondering, is, is there... In, in response to sort of an excess on the Christian side, which was denigrating Jews to the, to the extent of denying any sort of special election of any kind, is there also How about an denying all civil rights? Denying all civil rights. How about restricting? I mean, you know, there were there were very serious restrictions put on the permissible behavior of Jews 
um, over centuries in uh, Christendom. There yes. were expulsions. There were continual mass expulsions. Um, you know, uh, sometimes ordered by the Pope, sometimes order only ordered by by Christian monarchs. But um, so, I mean, you talked about Judaizing, but but I mean, I, I'm not in the business of Catholic bashing or church bashing. But you were asking, where did this resistance come from? To it being Christ, and the resistance came from knowing, uh, you know, two thousand years of history of persecution of Jews in the name of Christianity. Now, I'm not saying it's Jesus's fault; he was a Jew, um, but it was done in the name of Christianity very often, and therefore, I saw Christianity as the greatest disaster to ever befall Judaism. Right. That's, I don't know if that was your question or not. Yeah, I, I mean that was that was it. Just getting at the um, the generational link between Jewish identity and this resist this deep seated resistance, and that makes sense. This animosity uh, displayed by Christians towards Jews manifested in all sorts of ways. Um, but one of the things you emphasize in your book is how. Jews who convert, now you say in the book, you don't really like the term conversion because when you go through these different Jews who have been baptized, Alphonse Redisbon, the Lehman brothers, Rabbi Zoli, um, who took the name Eugenio after Pius XII, um, you, you emphasize again and again how much they sort of experienced a greater identification with their Jewishness in some way. Um, that they they felt like they were fulfilled Jews in some way. Can you elaborate on what that what that means for a Jewish convert to have some sort of fulfillment? Um, one reason conversion uh, doesn't seem entirely appropriate. I mean, I don't mind it. I mean, it's the common phrase, but it doesn't seem appropriate is because there is nothing. There is nothing in Judaism that Judaism teaches um, that is not embraced by the Catholic Church as divinely revealed truth. Um, if you stop Judaism 2,000 years ago, okay, if you stop at the time of Christ, there is nothing in the Old Testament that is not the word of God in the eyes of the Catholic Church. There is nothing about what Judaism taught about the Jewish people, about the Gentiles, about God, about sin. All of that is 100% embraced by the Catholic Church, except for changes done in the last 2,000 years to Judaism. So a Jew does not leave Judaism at all um, when he enters the Catholic Church. He follows Judaism into the Catholic Church because Judaism was transformed into the Catholic Church with the coming of Christ and with the death of Christ. And, and you know that the very first crisis in the church that required the first church council in, in about 51 AD, right? The Council of Jerusalem. What was that crisis? That crisis was, uh-oh, are we allowed to let non-Jews into the church? Or is the church only for Jews? You're aware of that, right? Yes, of course. Of course. It's in, in Acts, I think, uh, chapter 15. So, you know, everyone then understood that if the church is for real, if Christianity is for real, it is the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the Jewish Messiah. Hence the question is this only for the Jews? Because Judaism was only for the Jews. So, you know, where, where do you get the idea of conversion? Except that, except that by having missed the boat, so to speak, 2,000 years ago, you know, the Jews who didn't follow Christ are actually outside of Judaism. <laughs> They're actually outside of Judaism. Um, and I can talk a, a painful length about that. But because the, the real Judaism became the, the Catholic Church. Yeah, I'd like to get back into that about what was added in 2000 years. But I want to mention the very important point is that the um, that you mentioned previously is that the Blessed Virgin Mary was instrumental in your conversion. Um, and you mention in chapter one, as you mentioned before, how Our Lady truly personified the greatness of the Jewish race and the calling of the Jews. Um, what is the role of Our Lady? in softening the hearts of Jews for receiving Christ? She's, um, 
you know, I only know anecdotally, kind of statistically, she's certainly involved in a great, in a high percentage of Jewish conversions. You mentioned Alphonse Radisbone, who was converted from being an atheist, very anti-Catholic Jew, to being a, um, you know, a priest and a founder of a religious order through the only church approved apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Rome to this day. It was in the middle of the 19th century. Um, she was instrumental in my conversion. Um, uh, I have another book, uh, not only Salvation is from the Jews. I don't know if you put this underneath or not. Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews find the sweetness of Christ. It's got uh, 16 Jewish Catholic witness testimonies. And I would say probably over half of them, the Blessed Virgin Mary played a significant miraculous role. Um, and, but I can only speak for myself, and that is that Jesus was a threatening figure to me, ha however ridiculous I might sound, you know, to a cradle Catholic. Um, yeah, he was kind of a threatening figure. He, he was the um, uh, commander in chief of the enemy forces, so to speak, persecuting the Jews. Uh, if Jesus had introduced himself to me, let's say, I, I would have, it would have been a very hard sell, but the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, can hardly be a threatening figure. I, for, first of all, I didn't even really know who she was, but second of all, you know, she is pure femininity, love, acceptance, um, uh, warmth, beauty. So, uh, you know, and, and basically, if I bought into the Blessed Virgin Mary, I knew it came with the uh, price of having to buy into Jesus. <laughs> but anyway, that was kind of like, well, oh, well, it's, I guess it's worth accepting Jesus if it's the only way I can get the Blessed Virgin Mary. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, I love what you say. Uh, 361. My initial foray into Christianity was into a Protestant church. But when I brought up the topic of Mary with the pastor, his thinly veiled contempt made me say to myself, I'm out of here. <laughs> I love yeah. what you say there. Uh, just yeah. sort of the the action of Our Lady that really uh, cemented the reality to you. Um, but I want to bring up and talk about what was added and um, have you elaborate further on what you meant by Jews outside of Judaism. You say on 124, uh, the Talmud, needless to say, does not set out to confirm Christianity, quite the opposite. There are nonetheless several passages in the Talmud that inadvertently confirm some of the claims of Christianity. I found this very fascinating. Can you elaborate on some of what the Talmud says about Christianity that seem to confirm things? Uh, sure. Well, um, okay. <laughs> First of all, the, 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 the backdrop of this is that there are many rabbis today who will argue that um, Jesus never existed, period, that he's a fictional character. Um, the Talmud confirms that Jesus existed, that he um, he was sometimes referred to as uh, Jesus the Nazarene, from obviously from Nazareth, that he performed miracles, that he grew up in Egypt, and that his uh, mother was purported to be a virgin, um, and that he he performed uh, great miracles during his life, that he led many of the Jewish nation astray, and that he was executed by order of the priests um, on the eve of Passover. All of that's true, right? When he was 33 years old, I think actually it also there's there's a passage that says he was 33 years old at the time. So the the basic biographical outline is actually already there in the Talmud, which I'm not asking Catholics to believe it because it's in the Talmud, anything but. But it's dishonest of Jewish rabbis to say that Jesus is a fictional figure because they're denying their own sacred scripture when they do so. And by the way, um, they're, they're not always honest to tell the truth. Um, uh, apologists in general are sometimes not honest, but Jewish apologists against Christianity, they're called anti-missionaries. They have been known to be um, turn a blind eye to things that they know, assuming that a listener doesn't know. 
and only acknowledge it when it turns out the listener does know. And this is one of those areas to some extent. Uh, the most beautiful confirmation of Christianity in the Talmud to my eyes is that um, it's the miracle of the scarlet thread or the miracle of the scarlet cord, which is recounted in both the Talmud and the Zohar. And um, you know that on, um, I mean, I shouldn't say that because why should you know? But some people know, some people don't know that, you know, the temple had a Holy of Holies and the Holy of Holies was, you know, the inner chamber where God dwelled. And even the high priest was only allowed to enter the Holy of Holies one day a year which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that one day of the year, he would enter the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice for the remission of the sins of the Jewish nation. And before he did so, a scarlet cord would be hung around the entry of the Holy of Holies. And when that sacrifice, if that sacrifice was accepted for the remission of sins of the Jewish nation, both the Talmud and the Zohar recount that that scarlet cord would miraculously turn white so the Jewish nation would be kind of assembled outside the Holy of Holies with their eyes fixed on that cord, and there'd be great jubilation when the cord turned white, showing that the sins of the Jewish nation had been remitted. Now, the Talmud recounts that this miracle occurred almost every year until about 40 years before the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed about 72 AD, so the Talmud is saying that this miracle ceased to occur when Jesus died on Calvary with the birth of the church, essentially. So that is one heck of a beautiful confirmation of the truth of Christianity uh, in the Talmud. Yes, that's that's truly remarkable. Um, the um, I was trying to find the reference to that, but I know you also, oh, that was Rosh Hashanah 31b, if any viewers would like to know that, where that story comes from. There's also Talmud Yoma 9b, where you, where it mentions how um, the it says the Talmud says why was the second sanctuary destroyed? Seeing that in that time the Jews were occupying themselves with the Torah, the precepts, and the practice of charity, because therein prevailed hatred without cause. So, is there no elaboration further in the Torah as to or in the Talmud as to what is this hatred without cause? It just says that. Um, I think there is, I think, I know there is you know, elaboration in, um, in the Jewish Apocrypha. Um, I don't know if there is, I, I would assume there is in the Talmud. The Talmud, you know, is, is yeah, like a seven volume or, yeah. <laughs> uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, it's, yes. it's four feet of shelf space. And, um, you know, I'm not, you're not talking to a Talmud scholar. Uh, there is elaboration in, which is, I mentioned in Salvation is from the Jews, in one of the Jewish Apocrypha about the nature of that hatred without cause. I am, I'm going, can I address something on the chat Certainly. screen? Yes. Okay. Um, the, I see that somebody says that what the Talmud says about the Blessed Virgin Mary is pure evil and so forth. I, I would argue that's unfair. I mean, if you believe the story of Christianity, of course, one is prepared to believe in the virgin birth. But if you think that Christianity is largely fiction, not that Jesus is fiction, but that, you know, him being the Messiah is fiction, that he was actually not the son of God, that he was not the Messiah, but he was simply a pretender to be the Messiah, which makes him a not very nice person. Then if you conclude that the Blessed Virgin Mary wasn't really a virgin, I don't think that's being horribly evil you're kind of painted into that corner if you don't accept Christianity. And it's rather unfair to condemn the Talmud for not accepting Christianity because the Jews who did accept Christianity were not the ones sitting around writing down the Talmud. They were already Christians. Okay, so you, that's what I was actually going to bring up is the, the controversial passages in the Talmud, um, which allegedly contain blasphemies against our Lord and our lady, yeah. but you're the saying blasphemy. that he wasn't really the Messiah. He was a false pretender to be the right. Messiah, which, which was punishable by the death penalty under Jewish law. So he was rightfully executed by Jewish law for being a false pretender to be the Messiah. Is, is that a horrible, I mean, it's, it's blasphemy in the sense that it's not true. 
but it's not the reflection of degenerate evil on the part of the people who wrote the Talmud. It's simply a reflection of the fact that they weren't Christian. Am I missing something? Right. You're just saying that uh, the Jews would draw that conclusion that Jesus was punished if if they believed that Jesus was not the Messiah and was a pretender. If they were starting with the with the rejection of Christ, they would then come to the conclusion yeah. that these things yeah. would be yeah. meted out. Right. Yeah. Now, can you? I, I've heard and I've not researched this closely, but the Birkat Haminim, the the cursing of the heretics. Some say it was added to the rabbinic right after the destruction of the temple to distinguish between the Jewish Christians and the Jews who rejected Christ. Um, St. Justin Martyr mentions it in his dialogue with Trifle the Jew that um, he says they are cursing us in their synagogues. I understand this is in the Babylonian Talmud. Is there any truth to this? First of all, first of all, when, when Justin the Martyr says they are cursing us in their synagogues. Is he saying that, uh, so Trifo is not saying that, Justin Martyr is saying that people like me, Justin Martyr, they're cursing in our synagogue, in their synagogues? Because in that case, that's just not true because the curse is for Jews who have become heretics. So the curse is on Jews who became Christian. It's not on Gentile Christians. Okay, so the the, the curse- word is heretic. The word, I mean, in other words, in the Birkat Haminim, Haminim, I mean, it's the curse on, or it's the blessing on the Minim. Minim means heretic. If you're a Gentile follower of Jesus, you're not a heretic. You're only a heretic if you move away from the true faith. Okay. So, so yeah, it was a curse on Jews who apostatized and became Christian. Okay. Okay. So this is the uh, narrative that's given. Now, I, I, Wondering about the establishment of rabbinic Judaism later codified in the Talmud, because what has always struck me is the way when the Jews come back from exile and the Babylonian exile, they immediately build an altar and reinstate the sacrifice according to the Aaronic priesthood before the temple is made. And now, why did the rabbis not reinstitute the sacrifice? after the second temple was destroyed? Could they not have reinstituted uh, the Aaronic priesthood and the sacrifice in some other place? No, uh, they they couldn't, but I, I don't have a crystal clear understanding of that either. But my understanding is that the law binding on the Jews about where sacrifice could take place evolved over the course of the Old Testament because um, in the early days, I mean, you had, well, Abraham is awfully early, but, you know, you had you had uh, legitimate sacrifices being offered. I mean, look at look at uh, Elijah offering the sacrifice in Muhraka, you know, when, remember the duel of the prophets and stuff um, in, in the Northern Kingdom. Yeah. So in the early days, sacrifices were not restricted to the temple. And then later they became restricted to the temple. And I don't know the passages in the Old Testament that kind of trace that evolution. But my understanding is that by the time you had um, basically the, the second temple, by the time you had, um, you know, Jesus came along, um, it was understood that Jewish law would not allow sacrifices anywhere except in the temple. Okay. Now, I've also heard that in the Talmud there is the teachings of Rabban Gamaliel, who is venerated as a saint in the East. Um, there's also, I've heard, a devotion to Kepha, i.e. St. Peter. Um, is there any role that the Talmud can play, seeing that it does contain some teachings sort of from the time of Christ that have nothing really to say about Christ? Uh, can, can Jewish Catholics bring anything from the Talmud to their faith? You know, there are lots of, there are lots of Gentile Catholics who, I don't want to say are Judaizers, but, you know, you can find lots of, you know, liberal Jesuit scholars who love poring over the Talmud 
And um, there was a document that came out of the Vatican on, I forgot what it's called, the proper way of reading Old Testament scripture. Do you remember that? It was probably about 20 years ago. Notes on notes on the reading of the Old Testament. It's not called exactly that. But so you have a stream in the Catholic Church, usually a fairly liberal scholars, who do look for wisdom in the uh, Jewish exegesis of the Old Testament texts. Um, I think it's safer for them to be in that business than for Jewish Catholics, for Hebrew Catholics to be in that business, right? Because they're not going to be accused of, um, you know, polluting. Well, maybe they will be accused of polluting Catholicism, but, you know, in a way, you know, it's, it doesn't seem incumbent on, I, I don't feel comfortable playing that role of trying to bring more Judaism into Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in the terms of bringing more Judaism into the Catholicism, um, you mentioned on page, um, well, let me ask you this first, since we have some more time. Um, the, let's see, which page is this? Page 51, you write about the Jews and the Gentiles in the early church as a refutation of the USCCB's reflections on covenant and mission. Um, what are the modern, and you mentioned some of those previously, but what are the some, some of the modern errors that are um, being promoted? What exactly is the USCCB teaching exactly on these things? Um, and what are, what are these errors that are to be avoided? Okay, first of all, the USCCB itself rescinded that document, Reflections on Covenant and Mission. They were polite. They they issued a new another document a few years later called Notes on the Proper Understanding of Reflections on Covenant and Mission or something like that. <laughs> okay. So, but they basically backpedaled because they could not, you know, they could not deny that it was heretical. Hmm. If, number one. Number two, the USCCB also denied that it was ever an official document. Um, but it was simply a, like a working paper from a subcommittee. So the, the backpedaling was kind of breathtaking. Um, but that's not really your question. Your question is what was in there that is so questionable? And that is essentially the dual covenant theory, which says the church has no business evangelizing Jews because Jesus came to institute the church to bring salvation to Gentiles. Uh, because the, the Jews don't need the church for salvation because they're still in their original saving covenant with God. And that is a direct quote that is still in their original saving covenant with God is a direct quote from uh, actually uh, between you and me, Cardinal Casper. I see. Uh, <laughs> and um, the way liberals or heretics or whatever you want to call them work in the church is if they can find a quote from a cardinal that was given in a lecture somewhere, somehow they decide they will elevate it to dogma and take the ball and run with it. <laughs> so um, anyway, but that quote, I think is I, basically, that's, that's, that's irreconcilable with Catholic dogma that there's no reason to evangelize Jews because they're still in their original saving covenant with God. We know certainly the letter to Hebrews makes it very clear St. Paul makes it very clear that whatever salvific value there was in sacramental Judaism before Christ no longer exists. St. Paul actually makes it clear that it didn't work even then, but nonetheless, and um, you just can't get around that. And also, by the way, as I said early in the show, even if God was honoring the original salvific covenant, the Jews haven't honored it since the temple was destroyed. So it's kind of a non-issue. Hmm. Um, now have you, I'm not sure if this ever came in English translation, but Benedict the 16th emeritus recently, I, I mean, the past few years, he, he released something that was, that was to the effect of there is no mission to the Jews. Did you read any of that? Do you know what his thought is on that? I, um, I would have, I would, I would have to see. I, I would have to see the quote in, in the context. Sure, I, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't know if it even came into English translation. So, um, um, I don't know if you read German. I, but uh, 
I, 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 um, I have read some things from uh, Pope Benedict and from Cardinal Ratzinger, actually, that um, that certainly I don't know how to put it. That that make me think that he is trying to placate the liberal wing a little bit more than I would be concerned with doing, but. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger at the time of Vatican II was a liberal. You know that, right? Yes. I mean, so um, whether he said something in the 1980s, you know, when he said it also means something. Um, and the context in which he said it, uh, I think he was trying to play nice at various times, uh, a, li a little nicer than I would have, you know, with the Jewish community. But I don't think that, anyway, I don't yeah. want to get in the business. Sure, yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, fair enough. Um, now, you you talk about the Holocaust, the Shoah, the influence on Jewish thinkers. You talk about Elie Wiesel and the intense wound in not only Jewish uh, memory, but Jewish theology. And how can Catholics truly present the gospel to Jews? Um, while keeping this sort of razor edge between an election on the one hand and a special favor and love that God has to the Jews and avoiding the dual covenant on the other. It's not a razor's edge. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's Mount Olympus or something, or it's the Mount Everest. It's not a razor, razor's edge between the two. The two are not like, they don't like, like, you know, merge in a gray area in the middle. I, I they, 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 I don't want to say they bear no relationship to each other, but, um, you know, okay. Stupid, a, st a stupid uh, metaphor. Okay. A father really, really, really loves his son. Okay. And, um, he promises his son, when you turn 17, I will buy you a Ferrari. Okay. And when the son turns 17, the father buys him a bright yellow Ferrari and is parked in the driveway. And then the son comes home and he sees this bright yellow Ferrari. And he says, forget this. I wanted a red Ferrari. You know, I want nothing more to do with you. Um, did the father stop loving his son? <laughs> did the father not fulfill his promise? Or is the problem you know, that the son did not understand the promise correctly. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So there, there's no, it's not a, you know, it's not a very, I don't think it's a confusing area at all. Um, you know, the Jews, the Jews were elected primarily to, for the honor of bringing salvation to all of mankind through the incarnation of God as man, as a Jew within Judaism. Okay. God certainly honored that election, right? God made promises um, to Abraham, uh, you know, about his progeny in perpetuity, uh, uh, be, having a special relationship with God in some sense, having a special election. And we know from scripture that 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 is still being honored. We don't know what it means, which is why I wouldn't go there when you asked me, what's this election mean? Uh, but we know it doesn't mean salvific, sacramental Old Testament Judaism, which hasn't been followed in 2,000 years. So, you know, there's no razor's edge there that I can see. Okay, excellent. Well, you mentioned um, keeping Jewish identity in the church, page 69 and following. You mentioned three different lines of thought. One, you reject, which you've already mentioned already as is rejected, which is the idea that God still wishes Jews to follow the Jewish laws and festivals even in, after they become Christian. But then you discuss a pragmatic reason for keeping a Jewish identity and also an eschatological reason for keeping a Jewish identity. Could you elaborate on what would this mean to keep, just practically speaking, what would it mean for Jews to keep their identity as Catholics? And what would be those reasons pragmatically and eschatologically? Um. Oh no, I can't. I can't answer what it would mean for a Jew to uh, keep his Jewish identity because 
because uh, that's probably going to be different for every Jew. I mean, you know, I am very aware of the Jewish holidays. I pray them in, in a Catholic context. Um, I see many of the Jewish holidays as prefigurements of their fulfillment in Christ. Um, I certainly feel Jewish. <laughs> you know, what's that mean? I don't know, but I feel Jewish, you know. And I, um, I think of myself as a Jew. I, I can't explain what that means, okay? Uh, but I, you know, I don't feel like I've stopped being a Jew at all. I feel like I'm a Jew in the Catholic Church. Um, if I had great grandchildren, I have no idea whether they'd be Jews in the Catholic Church or whether they'd be, you know, Gentile Catholics or not. I mean, it's none of my business in a sense. But I have not lost my sense of my own Jewish identity. That has a pragmatic value because if you're trying to evangelize a Jew, you can't successfully tell them, you know, oh, by the way, you're going to stop being Jewish. Because that would be like somebody telling you you're going to, you know, stop being an American or you're going to stop being Caucasian or something. I mean, in other words, you know, it's inconceivable. So uh, pragmatically, for evangelizing Jews, it's very useful to say, oh, by the way, you don't stop being Jewish when you enter the Catholic Church. Jesus was Jewish. Mary was Jewish. St. Peter was Jewish. All of the apostles were Jewish. The first crisis in the church is, is the church only for Jews. You know, wh where do you get the idea that you stop being Jewish when you enter the first Catholic Church? It, it, it's much easier for a Jew to, to accept the concept of entering the Catholic Church if they see not only do they not stop being Jewish, but they become better Jews because they're becoming Jews who are following the Jewish Messiah, who is always the point of Judaism. Right. Absolutely. I want to ask one last question, then we'll have some chat questions. Um, you mentioned the bull of uh, Pope Eugenius IV, Cantata Domino, which is sort of dogmatizing the fact that the sacramental rites of the Old Covenant do not have self-efficacy. And there's another document from Benedict XIV in 1756, which is interesting to me. He says this, quote, although the ceremonial precepts of the old law have come to an end with the promulgation of the gospel and the new law does not contain any precept which distinguishes between clean and unclean food, nevertheless, the church of Christ has the power of renewing the obligation to observe some of the old precepts for just and serious reasons, despite their abrogation by the new law, end quote. That's paragraph 63. Um, is there any, do you think there's any potential for the church to renew the obligation to observe some old precepts for the sake of some sort of ethnic identity of Jews who come into the church? I think, no, I mean, I think it would be ridiculous for the entire Catholic church to say it's now a sin to eat pork. For all Catholics? I mean, come on. <laughs> Why would they? I mean, what sense would that make? I mean, a Jew who enters the Catholic Church is free to choose not to eat pork as long as he doesn't think it's incumbent on them under pain of sin to not eat pork, right? I mean, look, you know, you have a, uh, okay, um, okay, you have monks, for instance. You have some monks, not all monks, who only bathe once a week because it's part of their mortification. You know, they 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 want to make the sacrifice of being uncomfortable a lot of the time. Um, they choose to deprive themselves of something that's licit as an offering, a free will offering to God. A Jew in the church is free to do the same thing and decide not to eat non-kosher food as a free will offering to God. There are religious orders that don't eat meat, right? Period, ever, as that kind of free will offering. So there's nothing that says that a Jew in the church can't stay kosher as long as he's doing it for the right reasons. But to impose something like that on the whole church, I, look, I'm not going to second guess a pope. If a pope does that, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. But I don't understand the logic of it. Right. I, I mean, the only, the only analogy that I could think of was what you brought up in terms of a particular group doing a particular thing, you know, an allowance for that, a certain group of Catholics doing something like that. Um, but we have some questions from the viewers. Um, one is just asking about authors who, other Catholic authors who 
sort of have an opposition to Jews or sort of the, I spoke last week with Charles uh, Morowitz um, about sort of the so-called left-wing Jews who are in society. And um, there are some Catholic authors who write with great vehemence against those Jews. Um, do you have any opinion on the effect, negative or otherwise, of these other authors who sort of have a strong opposition to Jews? <laughs> I'm lost. I don't actually follow the question. You mean, do I have do I have a, a, a response or a reaction to authors who blame all Jews for the behavior of some segment of left-wing Jews? Is that the question? Yes. Well, I that's ridiculous. I mean, that's ridiculous in any case. I mean, you know, if if a Jewish author, how about a, a religious Jewish author blaming all Catholics because Margaret Sanger was Catholic? I mean, I wouldn't approve of that Jewish author blaming all Catholics because Margaret Sanger was Catholic. I'm 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 yeah. afraid I don't quite understand the sense the sensibleness of the question. Yeah, I, I understand. Uh, thank you. So um, Andrea is wondering if you can tell us about wonderful Jewish saints like Edith Stein. Uh, go to my YouTube channel and I have like a four hour, actually, actually I think I have about six hours, uh, two live streams on Edith Stein. Um, one on her life and one on her philosophy and theology. I have, uh, you know, seven minutes left on this show. So I can't tell you much about Edith Stein. Yes, yes, uh, uh, a wonderful saint. Uh, however, um, there's a uh, Maximilian Colby as well. Uh, it's a great talk you have on him. I have on my my I have a YouTube channel. If you spell my name right, it's easy to find. I have a YouTube channel. I have a series on there called Saints and Spiritualities. I think I have about fourteen episodes. And there's an episode on St. Maximilian Kolbe, and there are a couple of episodes on St. Edith Stein. And one of the wonderful things about it being a YouTube video is that one can put in film clips, one can put in photographs, um, as well as, you know, the information and the readings and stuff. So, so and they're free. See, I am converted. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, any thoughts, any final thoughts for us? Uh, Roy Showman, thank you so much for coming on the show. Any final thoughts for us? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to one. I'll, I'll respond to one theme that's been in the chat stream a little bit, which is um, Jesus says very many, very harsh things about Jews in the New Testament. There's no question about that. I have some great shows on that, by the way, because in fact, many of his parables have a specific application to, to Jews. However, the context for that is everybody in the New Testament is a Jew. All the good guys are Jews. All the bad guys are Jews. All of the hoi ploys who don't matter are Jews. All of the leaders are Jews. All of the traitors are Jews. All of the heroes are Jews. So it is true, for instance, and this I'm going to leave, this I'm going to close with actually, because, because one of the wonderful things of the last four months is I think most of us have become aware that our leaders, political leaders, legal leaders, judicial leaders in this country are unspeakably more corrupt than we ever imagined, okay? And <laughs> I, I, I think YouTube will allow that. I won't go any further. <laughs> yeah. but, but, and yes, the leaders, the Jewish leaders in the New Testament were unspeakably corrupt. They weren't unspeakably corrupt because they were Jews. They were unspeakably corrupt because they had infinite power with no accountability just like our Supreme Court justices have infinite power with no accountability, just like our leader of the Senate has infinite um, authority or a power without any accountability. So, so the evil that you see in Jews in the New Testament by and large is actually, I say universally, it's not because they're Jews. It's because 
everyone in the New Testament was a Jew, and there are a lot of evil people, and the more power you get, and the higher you get to the top, the um, the more it breeds, you know, elitism, arrogance, abuse of power, and so forth. Right. So, so um, anyway, that's my anti anti semitism shtick for today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, I mean, I think of the sometimes there is, there are a lot of comments that come to this channel of that nature. And I, I, I find them just uh, failing to understand the Good Friday liturgy because it says, oh, my people, what I've done to you. And then the response is Kyrie eleison. And we should think of any sin done by any man, however evil he is, as, uh, as something that we're capable of too. And so it's not because of a particular race or ethnicity or whatever, uh, but uh, excellent points, uh, Roy. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work. Everyone read below and you can click on uh, Roy's work below for all of his, uh, his books, his channel, his podcast. So let's offer up on our father for the conversion of the Jews. Let's pray for our, our Jewish brethren to be baptized and know the Messiah and that uh, people like Roy's work can continue to progress for the greater glory of God and the salvation of souls. So let's pray. Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.